training, but that's okay. But it's the 13th, yeah. Yes. All right, Jim. Uh, I was talking earlier, the 13th in the hanging world is a really uh, kind of a super, super uh, superstitious day. Uh, a lot of the, the nooses that they used to hang folks used to have 13 wraps on them. A lot of the stairs that they would ascend for a hanging had 13 steps on them. The gallows that were in the prison uh, theater, in the Clark Theater in Deer Lodge, is in. <coughs> Move over. Oh. <laughs> You're just a blonde. There. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You're just a blonde. I'm just being, I hate it. <laughs> anyway, the, the gallows that were in the, in the W.A. Clark uh, Theater in, in Deer Lodge have 13 stairs. Uh, anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, Hello, Dr. John. <coughs> Grab a chair. You want to here? Let's see. Empty one? There's one over there. The last one first. Okay, my, my topic today is uh, legal hangings in view. I, I'm surprised to see a full room here. I, I didn't think that would have any people who would be interested in hangings and executions. But <laughs> <laughs> we must be on the same wavelength. Same wavelength. <laughs> So, it's because we're all addicted to true crime. <laughs> yeah, I don't read true crime either. <laughs> but I, I don't read ghosty stuff either, but I do ghost stuff. So. Anyway, did you know that there's a set of gallows in the basement of the courthouse? The galloping gallows number five. And I, I'm, I was surprised that they were there in all, in all the history that I've ever had. I, I never knew that there were gallows that existed in the basement of the courthouse. Uh, so uh, I, I was taking a beauty history class with Chris Fisk at the high school, and we had a, a group of the nine and 13 folks that were uh, uh, interested in beauty history, and uh, Fisk had mentioned that he would had some students in his class that were told that there was a set of gallows at the courthouse. So as adult ed students, we were kind of interested too as to you know, what, what was required there, and Fisk didn't have the answers for that. So we thought we're going to have to research this a little bit, because maybe we might want to try and put them together. You know, if, if he does hands-on history, then, you know, maybe the adults could do hands-on history too. And that's kind of the approach that we took. So uh, we didn't want to do anything morbid, you know, and we didn't want to do anything that was really out of the ordinary as, as far as uh, kind of desecrating history or anything. But we did want to try and do something as far as history goes as to you know, the who, what, when, where, and why of hangings and how they were related in view. So, you know, we wanted to know who made them, and we wanted to know who was hanged on them. Uh, we wanted to know what were they were made of, when they were used, where did the hangings take place, why were these guys hanged, and how many times were they used? You know, a pretty basic question that we had answers zero to any of them. We had no idea. Our first thought was, since there's a ghost in the courthouse named Miles Fuller, we thought for sure that that guy must have been hanged on those gallows, you know, behind the courthouse, which isn't true. So, anyway, uh, Chris enlisted the help of our adult ed class. We were in the basement of the courthouse. This is the the gallows lever that you know that they use to uh, uh, execute the the uh, accused. And our adult ed class proceeded from there to see if maybe we could find some information about this, maybe even put this thing together. So we took these, we got permission and took these pieces out. Uh, we inventoried what was there, we arranged them as according to how, how these things could go together. Uh, we washed them off with a pressure washer. They've been, they've been in the gallows, or they've been in the basement of the courthouse since 1933, and I'm pretty much untouched. So they had, you know, 50, 60 years of dust on them. So, uh, we ain't hearing these people. Has Wayne Stodden here in the picture? <laughs> anyway, we assembled it in the alley between the courthouse and the, the uh, uh, Silver Bowl Center next door. And you can kind of see from these original pictures at the beginning, this is the cross piece across the top. And these were the trap doors that the uh, accused would drop through. So we kind of figured out how, how they went together. We had, we had to order some pieces. All the nuts and bolts for here were all gone. Or at least we couldn't find them anyway. Uh, but some of the ropes that they used to pull these levers and that were still there, but not the noose. You know, all the good stuff was gone, but the main, the main, uh, the main structure was there. So we, we assembled it and put it on a trailer. Uh, we thought that was a pretty good idea. You know, we put this thing together. 
This is, was really built well. Uh, this got mortise and tenon joints. You know how, how they put these together, so that'd be good and solid. The first time they used this, they hanged three guys, so it had to hold at least 550 pounds. Uh, the pieces were uh, marked here. You can kind of see there's an X1. Oh. Where did you push? I pushed the wrong one. <laughs> I know. There we go. There we go. What do I do? I don't know. Probably push the top one. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to stay away from it. That's why right. this is up in the corner. <laughs> anyway, you can see, if you can see down in this corner here, there's an X and a 1-1. One, one. All these main joints in here have Roman numerals, and the opposing part that fit together with that had the same Roman numerals. So this is X-1-1, one, one, and this is X-1-1, one, one, and that's how they fit together. And these over here, you can see this is V-1. B1, so it's been one and one. That's how those pieces fit together. So we, we kind of got to figure as to uh, how these pieces were assembled. So not knowing that that's how it was, we, we, still, uh, we still found a way to put them together. So that was pretty cool. Kim, I'm stuck again. Uh-oh. I want to reclaim my time. Uh, <laughs> I'm just being a smart ass. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, you know, so some other things that we noticed on here where these ropes came across on some of these uh, corners of these timbers, they were greased. And they had a nail in there to hold the rope together, and they had grease there so they would slide easier on these corners. That was pretty significant. Uh, they had a stop piece here on the bottom as a safety measure. So this bar here holds the trap doors together. So if, if you don't have this bar in place and that, that timber was turned backwards, those trap doors would open. So if somebody was standing up there and that safety wasn't there, those doors could open. Uh, these were the, the brackets underneath the hinges that swung the, the trap door open. Uh, these two things were pretty significant. We couldn't quite figure out what these were until we activated the doors. This is a, a window sash weight. You know these old windows in the, in the buildings? They got, they got weights on the sides to pull the windows up and down. Well, they use these to, uh, they attach these to the trap doors. So when the trap doors swung down, they wouldn't swing back and forth and beat against the poor body that was hanging there. So these weights would keep those doors down. So once they swung down, they'd kind of stay in place and not bang back and forth. We thought that was you know, pretty thoughtful of the dead. Uh, and then they, they took pieces of fire hose, inch and a half fire hose, and they put these on the back side of where those doors come down. And it was kind of like a shock absorber cushion buffer thing. So when those doors come down, it would hit these uh, pieces of fire hose here so the sound wouldn't be so bad because it's really noisy when these things slap down. Yeah, it's, it's pretty scary. So they put these there to kind of muffle that sound a little bit. Yeah. Pretty neat. So anyway, uh, in 2012 our adult debt class put this on Wayne's trailer and we uh, assembled this, all this nice 4th of July stuff on top of the gallows <laughs> and we had a mock execution that was held in front of the courthouse. Uh, originally, we figured we'd have 20, 30 people there, and we do it on the back side of the trailer here with, you know, we just face it towards the courthouse and the people could assemble on this back side. And we just do a little mock hang and, and just kind of run through a little brief history thing. But it kind of got overwhelming, 
And we ended up getting people out here in the street. And we had to block off Montana Street and Alaska Street because the crowd was too big. <laughs> we had more people here than they had inside the building for the centennial luncheon that they had. Uh, the police blocked the street off for us. And we did this execution. We, we had a death warrant for this fellow. We called him uh, Abad Man Longfellow. And his nickname was Stretch. <laughs> and we had a death warrant and all these accusations against him, which we accused him of, and uh, the judge said he was you know, guilty, so we, we hanged him. And we did hang him here. We had the, we had the sheriff and his boys were here, and John Walsh and some of his uh, henchmen there. We had a preacher there, and he gave him the last rites and whatever, and everyone. Wayne was testing this thing out so it would work. And we had a fellow there that we were going to hang, and we let him go because we thought he could be uh, he could be uh, rehabilitated. So we let him go. <laughs> and this was Stretch. We had him put up on the thing, and there was our master of ceremonies, our teacher, Mr. Fisk. And uh, we got our execution, and somebody filmed it, and it's on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to show it, but the the huge crowd really liked it. It's kind of like a fire. They, re they really like it, and they asked if we do it again. So we sent it back and we did it twice. Yeah. God, do you think we're morbid for doing this? It's pretty crazy, pretty crazy be crop. Anyway, then we had it in the 4th of July parade. So these are some of the fellows that were hanged on that. The gallows that, that are in the basement of the courthouse uh, executed eight individuals. Six of them in Butte and two of them elsewhere. And as being galloping gallows, that meant that they were going to travel to different cities. So our gallows went to Boulder for hanging, and they went to Shoto for hanging. And the others were hanged here view. So, uh, the gallows now are in the basement of the courthouse. We put them all away, and they're, uh, they're safe. And they can get this package. We forgot to hand these out. No, I didn't get there. But anyway, when, when we put it away, we wanted to. We wanted to uh, at least have some kind of record. If someone else wanted to do this in the future and realize what these were and how they went together, you know, we, we assembled a little package that has a, it has a schematic drawing of what's in here. It has pictures of what went on. We've got a recorded record of what happened and, and the execution and what we did with it and who, who were those that were condemned and who were died and, and the whole story that goes with it. So those in the future that may uh, find those gallows down there and want to do something with it. We still be a history that goes with it that gives the true accord of, of what they are, what they're about, and you know, what they were used for in the past. So, so where do we get the information for this? Uh, my, one of my first sources was uh, John Astle, only in Butte. He's a great writer. Uh, he, was, he was a friend of mine before he passed away a few years ago. And he had several stories in here. Uh, about the hangings in view. Also, Ellen Baumler, some of you might be familiar with Ellen Baumler. She likes to write ghost tales and stuff. She worked for the Montana Historical Society for years. She's got several books out. She covered hangings as well. And my favorites are two book, books written by a guy named Tom Donovan. He lives in Great Falls. And I spoke to him three or four weeks ago. He's a great guy. Uh, and he got interested in this because one of the fellows that was involved in the Galloping Gallows that we had in the basement, uh, a guy named Roy Walsh that murdered a guy in, uh, by, over by Whitehall, he was related to the guy that was killed. And that kind of started him in his research and it, it just kind of went crazy. Uh, and, but he's, he's covered every incident of any kind of hangings in the state from back before vigilante days up until the last hanging. So if you're interested in that stuff, uh, this book's out of print, but you can find it. And this one's still available. This one's on for, for sale here. Uh, and if you like hanging and stuff, this would be the Bible, in, in my estimation, or anything about hangings in, uh, in Montana. So uh, also, the best information you can get is found here in the archives. Uh, there's nothing like the old view papers. View, view, the uh, Butte Miner and the Montana Standard and the Anaconda Standard for finding stuff about things that happened, you know, in our town here in the past. Also, the Montana Historical Society has great stuff. They got a lot of photos. 
Uh, they didn't have the photos I wanted. I was looking for actual photos of the hanging and uh, things uh. like They didn't have them, and they didn't have them of the, uh, a lot of the, the guys that they did hang. Also, there's a set of gallows in the Fort Missoula Museum in their garage down there. Interesting fact, the, the gallows they have, Butte sent them the diagrams and the schematics for building uh, their gallows that were patterned after ours. So I think that's pretty significant. We like to be number one. Yeah. Uh, as far as hangings in Butte, some of the first ones uh, we had were we had a lynching at a place called Fu Chow, which is a rocker. Uh, There's an Irish guy that was down there, and on the 4th of July, he, his luck wasn't running so good, so he thought he'd hang a Chinaman. Uh, excuse me, Asian. Ah, kids have killed him. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but anyway, he hanged a guy down there for good luck. Uh, it didn't, it didn't work. Uh, another lynching that we had in Butte was Frank Little. And when they hanged him, this note was on his underwear. And they pinned on his underwear. 3777, which are the vigilante slogan for the Adventures of a Grave. And Frank Little was buried out on the New Cemetery. And they think that these goons and members of the company and the police department were part of that uh, hanging. Anyway, it, the hanging is all around the state. The, the hangings were dependent or, or were uh, orchestrated and taken care of by the sheriff of that county where the where murder occurred, it, you know, whatever, whatever event occurred. So these, this was Miles Fuller, and these were three fellows that were hanged in 1918, and this was James Martin we had the, that uh, was hanged in 1906. Uh, they were usually sent to law enforcement, judges, uh, victims' families, uh, friends, and some were even a little bit different. Uh, this, this was one of the uh, police officers in uh, the county jail. Uh, this was Judge Lynch. This guy happened to be the assistant fire chief. And this one here, Frank Miles, we had to look this guy up to see who he was. He was the elevator operator in the courthouse. <laughs> yeah, so how he got one, I'm not sure, but that was pretty neat. I thought that was pretty significant that, you know, friends could get in there too. His hanging was pretty neat. <laughs> anyway, Butte's, number one, Butte's had the most legal hangings in the state. Uh, you know, our claim was always, we like to be number one. So, uh, in Butte, they used two sets of gallows. One was Galloping Gallows number three. Uh, it was used 13 times across the state. It was designed, uh, and was supposed to be used in Butte first. But before we got a chance to do it, they had something come up down in Deer Lodge, so they borrowed them before we could even get to use them. So they were they were used down in uh, Deer Lodge first, and uh, they were used four times in view. Galloping Gallows number five, which is the ones in the basement of the courthouse, they used it three times, and they executed six men. So if you do your math there, you can see that three times and six men. So you, you can see there were multiple hangings at the same time. So the first time they used it, they hanged three guys. The next time they hanged two guys. And the next two times were single hanging. So, and we also sent it to two different counties for uh, execution. So th these gallows had a total of eight victims. So uh, you're all familiar with the old courthouse, I'm sure. If not, this is the old courthouse at the location of the present courthouse. But they disassembled all this and uh, this is where the first hangings took place. There were four hangings that took place behind the courthouse. I'm a real nerd on Sanborn maps and drawings and stuff, so this is the old courthouse. This is where the jail was. This is kind of a blow up of that jail. <laughs> and around that jail was a big, tall fence. But this fence was made out of stone and brick. And on the top, cemented into the top was broken glass and shards of sharpened steel so people couldn't climb in and people wouldn't climb out and it was, during the times of these hangings it was pretty neat because people you wouldn't think would be sitting on these walls but they were so again you, it's like fire you, you like this stuff okay there's a there's two different types of hangings uh, methods the first is called the jerk type 
And it was used in, in uh, the state from 1889 to 1906. Uh, would you guys like to see how it works? Okay. I'm going to need some help. Yeah, I'm going to need some help. I'm a real history nerd, so. Yeah, I'm use this one. Okay. This, this is a model of Galton Gallows number three. Uh, no, no, don't laugh at me. <laughs> I got, I got two boys that are engineers, and they really, they really beat me up for this stuff. I think I could do better than to do this kind of stuff on a weekend. Anyway, uh, you'll see some pictures in a minute. Let's turn it around. Anyway, th this, would be, this would be the accused, and this, this would be Gallows number three, and they'd have a rope tied to this guy's neck, and go up to a pulley, over to another pulley, and then down here into this executioner's shed. So they didn't want to know who the executioner was. It could be, you know, bad luck, or the family might go after him or something. So they all, always hid the executioner behind a wall here, so you wouldn't know who he was. So. Yeah, so, Captain America. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, who else better to hang somebody than right. Captain America? Yeah. <laughs> so what they did with they, they'd have a they'd have this fellow get up on this little stand here. And on the side behind, in the back, behind this executioner shed, they had like a 55 gallon drum full of metal. And it'd be, you know, heavier than the weight of the guy. So these were around 350, 400 pounds of weight inside these barrels. And it was tied to the fence here, just kind of on the skews. So all he'd have to do is cut this rope. And once he cut the rope, then that guy would be suspended in the air. So he would cut the rope, and up the guy would go. So, hence the jerk gun. So, uh, they thought this was too inhumane. They thought it didn't work very good. And if you didn't do your math right, they had the Army Corps engineers design the, the height of the, the, the rope was supposed to be and how far they should pull and the weight of the, you know, the gentleman that was going to be executed. If they didn't do the math right and they pulled that really hard, you kind of see what could happen. You know, it could pull the head right off. So they thought that was really inhumane. So they got rid of that and changed to the trap door method. Oh, ready for this yet? Yeah, we might as well do it now. Okay. And be careful when they fall down. Well, let's get in the middle and I'll set it there. It'll probably fall again. Kind of see that look, probably looks better. But I, I like to show them. Kind of hands on. This is the this was the gallows that they used. This is the pattern that we use, and it was pretty similar to that one we just showed. This is on the front page of the paper. I was hoping they had the guy with the rope around him when they had him up there, but I couldn't find that one. I was a little bit too morbid, I guess. Sorry, dear. Uh, I get it. Yeah, it's okay. I'm just spazzy. Uh, these were the first guy. The first four guys were. Hang behind the courthouse at Gallows number three. There's Harry Roberts, Dan Lucy, Jim, Jim Martin, and Miles Fuller. We'll go through them in a minute. But this was the next one called the trapdoor method, and it was used in Butte from 1918 until 1926. Uh, six victims were hanged in Butte, two elsewhere. Uh, they figured this was more efficient, we made a lot, a lot of portability. It hid the victors from the onlookers, and it was you know, deemed more humane. Now, how this worked is they, they could shroud the bottom, and for the first one, they even shrouded the top with a canvas. Uh, they put the rope behind the left side of your the left ear, so when it pulls you up in the air, it turns your neck in a hurry, and, and it breaks your neck, and you know, you're supposed to die pretty quick. Uh, in most of the accounts of these guys that were hanged, they usually died between six and seven minutes, and they, they did that, it usually broke their neck, but they weren't really officially dead until the two doctors that were holding their arms would check their pulse. And every minute they'd give the number of what that pulse rate was. And then usually after six or seven minutes, the pulse rate would be zero. And that's how they determined that. Uh, Butte's got the record for the longest and the shortest hangings. <laughs> Miles Fuller was brought out. It took two minutes to bring him from the jail out and hang him. 
in two minutes. It's a record for the state. And Dan and Lucy was the longest. They brought him out and they hanged him in the back of the, the courthouse. Uh, he was dead in six and a half minutes, but they let him hang for 21 minutes before they took him down. And when they, when they put the, the, the uh, rope around his neck, he had wiggled and instead of having to snap his neck, he had moved around to the back. So he hung there and he suffocated longer than most others. So and we've got different records for goofy things. But anyway, anyway, the first day, 1918, they designed these gallows. And this is the trapdoor method. Uh, and the first time they used this, they used it behind the courthouse in the, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but anyway, uh, they altered this two ways. One, you could do it underneath so you couldn't see who the executioner was. So you could pull the handle underneath and then drop out of sight. Or you could do it from the front like they did in, in other instances and they pulled a lever from the top. The sheriff liked to pull the lever so you could see him and he was the executioner. So I designed this so you could use it either way. But uh, I'm gonna show you this one. This was the case of three guys. And they put this behind that left neck of each one of them. Then when they were ready, there was a guy underneath when the sheriff gave him the signal, they dropped out of sight. Then, then you couldn't see him, they were under, underneath there. And, and I'll show you how they did that behind the courthouse. Put that with that, yeah, we're good. So, anyway, dirty history guys, sorry. They hanged them all at once? Yep. Yeah, these are those guys. Who was, uh, O'Neill, Fisher, and Powell were their names. And these, these are our gallows. These are the ones that are in the basement of the courthouse. That's what they look like. And these were the fellows that were hanged on gallows number five. We'll go through them in a minute. So, uh, Missoula County conducted the last legal hanging in Montana in 1943. Uh, they used our blueprints to do that. And that was, uh, that was the last of the hanging in Montana. You know, all these guys were murderers. Some were robbers. None of them were nice guys. You can't feel sorry for them. They all were, they were, they were all pretty criminal. Uh, yeah, they had multiple hangings and single hangings. Yeah, they kind of went through that stuff. Okay. Uh, Galloping Gallows number three, I don't know where they're at. I don't know if they used them for something else and repurposed them or if they're just gone, you know, could be used for something else. But anyway, uh, our, our galloping gallows are preserved and they're in the basement of the courthouse and they're locked up and they're safe. These are the gallows that are in Missoula and they're in the Fort uh, Missoula Museum in a garage. I talked to the gal there and she said, I heard of them, I'd never seen them. And she went out and looked at them. She took a picture and sent it back to me and said, yeah, we, we've got gallows there. So, they're pretty interesting. And these are the gallows, this gallows number six, Gall gallows number six, and they're in the Clark Theater in the prison in Herlock. And again, there's 13 stairs here that go up to the, up to the gallows. Okay, so now we kind of preview about how these gallows work. Uh, now we're gonna take a look at the victims and their history. You guys wanna play a little game here? <laughs> Do we have volunteers? That's your chance to get in the, get in the game. What'd you say? <laughs> you want to get in? Yeah. <laughs> here. No, I, I, I'm really nerdy, but don't hang, just don't hang them out. We'll, no, not yet. I'm gonna, we're we're going to select them. Okay. Is that okay? okay. I, I like interactive stuff. It, it makes things a little bit more, more fun, a little more interesting. I got a lot of work now. That's okay. I know how to do it. Uh, let, let's. I, I'm going to do this in, in, in grouping, is because I'm going to have you come up here and we'll partake in this little exercise. So I, I need. Uh, <laughs> let me pull this. Oh, sorry. I need to pull it out so that we can see what's going on. There. Oh. Okay. All right. 
Let's do this first. Uh, you got any guys in here that are team steers or like horses? <laughs> you can, yeah, you can be a gal. You, you like horses? Come on up. Yeah. You can be Harry Roberts. He was the first guy that we hanged here behind the courthouse. Great. You want to just put that behind your neck or over your neck? That would be good. Uh, you got any Irishmen in here that are plumbers? Irish plumbers. Irish, no Irish plumbers in here? Uh, we don't have anybody that fought in the Confederacy, I'm sure. Uh, we got any Irishmen? There you go, Jim Boyle. Jim Boyle, you'll like this one. Jim Boyle, yeah, you'll like this one. You know that guy I was talking to about a minute ago about who hung a long time? This be him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me down easy. Yeah. Let me down easy, yeah. 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 Uh, Jim Martin, anybody know, uh, anybody like Brown Gulch or Hill Columbia Gulch? Anybody from up that way? I think we should get one of the gyms to be a gym. Are you from Brown Gulch? Nobody's a gym. <laughs> well, we can do that, yeah. Come on up, come on up. You gotta come up. You come up. I'll try to be a little quicker. Anybody got a beard? Big, full beard. I saw a beard coming here. Any, any, you got any grumpy old men in here? <laughs> you ever see the show Grumpy Old Men? <laughs> you got any more grumpy old man in here? Yeah. Jim, Jim, you, Jim you're a grumpy old man. Miles Fuller, he'd be the ghost of the courthouse. There you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. Let's, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these guys first. Can I take a picture of you all? Do you mind? You look pretty cool. Okay, Harry, if you want to, you're going to be Harry Roberts. If you want to see your damage, uh, you, you were born in Wales in England in 1843. Uh, when you were executed, you were 59 years old. You were wagon boss. You, you were in the Civil War. You were even uh, uh, wounded in the Civil War. You killed a fellow named Te Long Tex Crawford. He was 38 and you were 59. He was, he was picking on you all the time. Uh, and you guys got into a fight one day. and uh, You went after him with a little knife and he scratched your forehead with a pitchfork. So, uh, <laughs> he, Harry went to the cops and said, can you do something about this? He, he's, this text is really a problem. And they said, don't no, handle it yourself. So he did. So uh, they were over by Neaterville, a place called the uh, Silver Bull House. And when Tex was in there after his day washing his hands, he was bent over the sink washing his hands. Uh, Harry Roberts went up behind him and shot him in the back with a uh, 38 Smith & Wesson. So he died. So Harry went to the, to the jail and they hanged him behind the courthouse in uh, August of uh, 1889. He didn't hang too long. Uh, one thing that he was known for is uh, when they put the rope around him, he said, can you make it a little tighter? It's too loose, it will hurt. <laughs> and right after that, they strung him up, and uh, he died in nine minutes. So, very good. That's your why, story. Why was it at 112 a.m.? Oh, most, most of the hangings were between midnight and 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. It was so they wouldn't have a big crowd, so they wouldn't have a lot of kids hanging around. Mm -hmm. And uh, it still didn't deter the crowd. They still, oh. yeah. so there you go. Cool. Good. Thank you for having me. Of course. Very good. Way to go, Harry. Uh, next guy, uh, Daniel Lucy, Mr. Moyle. Yeah, Daniel Lucy was a 42-year-old Irish plumber. He came from County Kerry. Uh, he worked at the Never Sweat Mine. Uh, he was in the war. He, he was a plumber, but when they utilized him during the service as a plumber and didn't pay him any additional pay, he got upset and deserted. So he moved out west. Uh, this guy got a terrific story. Uh, he was a miner at the Never Sweat. He ran, he ran, he was running with a guy named Pat Reagan. Not the same as the Pat Reagan that was a sheriff. It was a different Pat Reagan. Uh, and he talked young Pat Reagan into taking his money out of the bank and going with him to the Coeur d'Alene over in Idaho. And if they pooled their money together, he thought they could strike a rich and make a big ton of money. So uh, they went down to Rocker and uh, they were going to catch the train to the Coeur d'Alene's and Daniel Lucy said, well, let's walk to Gregson and you know, we'll catch that other you know, connection down there. So as they were walking through Durant Canyon, uh, Daniel Lucy got behind Patrick Gray and hit him over the head with a rock. Knocked him out, uh, was robbing him, and when he realized Patrick Gray didn't have all this money with him, he tore the inside of his coat jacket and everything out looking for all this money. Uh, 
since he didn't have all the money that he thought he had, he beat this guy's face in with a rock. Mm -hmm. Drug him down the creek, dug him down the hillside, drug him through a barbed wire fence, and threw him into the creek down there in Durand Canyon. Then he took off with the money and went to Gregson and went to Anaconda, and then really took off because he knew they were after him. And they caught up with him in Colorado, uh, brought him back to Butte, uh, and they set up the gallows in the center of the jail yard behind the courthouse. And the Ganyan line was up the hill, but by the original, and they said that hillside was black with people watching these, this hanging because it was in the center of the, the courthouse yard. So anyway, this, this guy was hanged, and uh, he's the one that did, he hung for 21 minutes before they took him down. And he's buried out St. Pat Cemetery, and they said he, his, his uh, gravesite is a stone's throw away from the victim that he had. Anyway. Any significance in the time? That you uh, what do you mean? The 21 minutes? Well, the 11 11. Oh, I don't know. It just happened to be the time. Really? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's coincidence or if it was planned. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that wish didn't come true. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Anyway, moving on. Uh, yeah, there was. They did. They did take this picture. It's on the front page of the paper. Mm -hmm. And you can see this is the old jail. And there's that wall that went around. Oh. And there's the gallows. And there's the execution wall. You know. And there's there's Daniel Lucy. And there are two priests that walked him out there. They said they kissed him before he went to mm -hmm. the other world. Yeah. Strange stuff. <laughs> anyway, James Martin. There we go. James Martin. Very good. Uh, this guy paired up with a guy named Charlie Lennox, and they were down at Silver Bowl. They robbed a guy named John Williams, and when they did, they murdered him. Uh, they, caught a, they caught the next train going south to Dillon, and some guys helped them get on the train, and they happened to know that these guys shot and killed this Williams guy. So when they got in the train car, they locked him, and when these guys got to Dillon, uh, the sheriff was waiting for him. They just unlocked the car and brought the guys back to Butte and put him in jail. So these guys broke out of jail, you know, a couple weeks later after they were in Butte. And there were six of them that broke out of jail, and uh, two of them turned themselves back right away. Uh, the other three got captured. And uh, this this guy, James Martin, went to Hale Columbia Gulch, Brown's Gulch, Hale Columbia. And he was up with the McGlynn's up in, in Hale Columbia and was uh, having breakfast when they'd squeal on them. And the sheriff and some guys went up and picked him up that next morning and brought him back to town and they hung him. Anyway, his partner's name was Charlie Lennox and he got away and they never did find him. He's still gone. He's still out there somewhere. But anyway, that's a story about James Martin. This guy's buried out at Mount Moriah. Uh, interesting thing about him, James Martin isn't his name. He didn't want his family or anybody to know who he was and, and he was really ashamed of what he did, so he didn't want his family to know. And the only ones that knew was the Butte Miner afterward, but they wouldn't print his name. So even out at Mount Moriah, he's listed as James Martin, and he's buried under the name James Martin, uh, but that's not his name. And all these guys, there's only one that has a headstone. All the rest of them, either, either in a pauper's field, uh, or in really, you know, the giggly weeds. Uh, but he's in a nice place that's got grass, but he doesn't have a marker. Mm -hmm. And there's one other guy that's got a grave site, and I'll show you that. Okay? Hey, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Hey, Jim. Thank you. If he was a transient, how did he get a marker and everything? He didn't get it. He doesn't have a marker. Oh, he doesn't? He doesn't, no. Oh, okay. Uh, moving on to Miles Fuller. Oh, doing my favorite. He was the oldest guy that was hanging here. He was 66. Uh, and this so that Miles Fuller and uh, Henry Gallahan were two guys like you know grumpy old men. Uh, you know, one accused the other of putting you know uh, strychnine in his in his flour, and the other one said you put ground up glass in the sugar. And one accused them, the other one of uh, hitting on little girls, and uh, they, they were just awful. So they fought with each other all the time. So uh, Henry Gallahan was walking home one night. He lived over beyond the, the McKinley School up down about the 1200 block of Silver Street. And uh, Miles Fuller followed him home. And down at Henry's Gulch, which is where McKinley School is, did down from the Henry Mine by Henry Street. Uh, Miles followed him down, and he took a shot at him and wounded him. So 
he walked up to him, was going to rob him, and he said, "No, I'll just leave." So he, he, it was in the, it was in, in the winter, and he, he walked away about a block, and realized that maybe he didn't kill him. So he went back and pulled out his knife and slit his throat. Oh, no. So, anyway, they, they figured it was Miles Fuller. He, he looks like Dale Burton. But anyway, he, uh, they, they knew who this guy was, and they picked him out and brought him up to the jail. And, uh, they hanged him behind the courthouse. They think this is the this is the guy that walks the halls, the old floor plan pattern of the old courthouse, even in the new courthouse. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody that really knows that. But this guy would be the, the ghost of uh, the courthouse. And he's buried out at Mount Moriah. And he's out in the giggly weeds, too. And I, I know where he's at. But, yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay, hey, we're, we're going to jump into the next bunch. Uh, these these three guys hang together. Uh, we got anybody that's kind of tall and skinny who likes to smoke cigs? <laughs> uh, anybody from Ohio? Would anybody like to be Frank Fisher? Come on, y'all. He's going to assign one if you don't volunteer. Uh, <laughs> oh, Johnny, Johnny, be Frank. Oh, he'll like this. This'll be fun. Okay. Do you want to another Irishman in here that likes pistols? That's a crappy shot. <laughs> I don't know. You may want to be John O'Neill. Come on. Very good. Oh, very good. Very good. Who's the biggest guy in here? Who's the biggest guy? Bert, you can be the biggest guy if you want. You want to be the biggest guy? You will be today. <laughs> you are today. Okay, you know, the, the newspapers did a lot of justice. So they like to write good stories. Uh, some of their stories were really good. And if you like this stuff, if you read the papers and, and look at them, you, you can really see some interesting stuff. Uh, it's really funny. When you, when you talk to folks like in adult ed now that just moved to Butte and just figuring out what Butte's about, you know, we had the city and the county. The city had a jail and the county had a jail. And the county's jail was behind the old courthouse, so that would be the old jail. And this was the new jail. Well, they had a fire in this jail and decided to build a new jail. So this is the old new jail. And now we have a new new jail behind us up here on Copper and Courts, between Copper and Courts on between Montana and Alaska. So anyway, this is the this is the new old jail. So anyway, <laughs> maps again, I love maps. This, this is the new courthouse, and this was the old jail. And these next guys that we're talking about tonight, or today, this was the jail, and this is where they hanged them. If you ever walk behind the courthouse, you go up Port Street here and you walk down the back stairway, and there's a big lawn out here now. And you walk down this way, right here, behind the courthouse. This, this is the boiler room, and this would be the stack, the furnace stack, the smoke stack. So right in this space here used to be the old coal chute. So they dropped the coal here and they get down to fire the furnace. So in this coal chute here, there's a space, and that's where they hang these guys. So in, in 1916, 1917, 1918, uh, he was getting pretty violent. Uh, there was a fellow named Thomas Higgins that, that worked at the, uh, he worked at the Never Sweat too. And uh, he, he watched two guys down the street, about, it was about where the entry to Naranchi Stadium is, uh, Porphyry and Wyoming. There are two guys, Mr. Fisher and Mr. O'Neill, were robbing a guy named Patrick Sullivan. Who worked at the uh, uh, he worked at the con and uh, this Thomas Higgins he yelled out to him you know said hey you guys you guys can't be robbing that guy They'd knock it off so uh, John O'Neill grabbed his gun and reached up reached you know looked up the street and kind of ran after him and shot him twice and he hit him in the thigh and he hit him in the ankle and this guy died later at the hospital of blood poisoning. Yeah. So that was John O'Neill and Frank Fisher. So uh, 
At the same time, there was a guy named uh, Sherman Powell who worked for the railroad. He was a porter. And he got into a beef with his uh, fellow uh, porter cook, a guy named Joe Montgomery. And he thought he got cheated in a card game, so he, uh, he cut his throat. So <laughs> anyway, it's another, another guy. So again, these things were going on. Frank Little got lynched in 1917. I didn't know who did it. Couldn't find out you know, who those perpetrators were. Uh, 168 guys, uh, uh, miners up in the Grand Mount speculator got killed underground in a disaster and a fire. The people in town were getting upset about what was going on. And between the judge and the sheriff, they said, you know, we got to set an example, so let's hang these three guys, and I'll get my undersheriff to give us some folks, and we'll build a set of gallows. So his undersheriff was Jack Melia, and there was a guy named Ted Angel, who uh, in, the, in the books, the directories, he was a hat maker, but on the side, he was a pretty good carpenter, and his boy was a carpenter. So they designed and built, with the help of M.D. O'Connell and Mike O'Connell, they built the gallows that are in the basement of the courthouse. And they, uh, they had a place where they could use these now. So they were going to use them behind the courthouse. So uh, Frank Fisher was our first guy here, Johnny. Yeah, no, you, you're good there. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys had nicknames too. They called this guy Cincinnati Slim, you know, and uh, uh, he went by Frank Fletcher, the 32 year old guy from Cincinnati, Ohio. And he was just kind of a partner. He was an accomplice in, in this murder of that uh, uh, Sullivan guy on Wyoming Street. So uh, these two guys took a shot at that guy, hit Mr. Higgins, and Higgins ran off. Uh, these two guys went uptown. And when they were uptown, they got picked up by a guy named uh, Philip Prilja. His name will pop up in history books later on. Uh, but they ran these two guys in, and they were in jail for quite a while. They were trying to fight their their sentencing. They said they, of course, they all said they never did it, uh, but they did, and they were, they were set up to be hanged. So, John O'Neill was the next guy. Again, he, this guy had an alias, too. His name was Ray Julick. Uh, he's only 25 years old. He came from uh, Missouri, and I don't know if he's a good shot or a bad shot. You know, if he was a good shot, he had two shots on his target, which is pretty good, but if he aimed to kill him, he didn't do very good. I mean, he only got him in the leg, but the guy ended up dying anyway. Uh, he wasn't very compliant. He was kind of a problem child while he was in jail. Uh, but eventually, they'd, uh, they'd square that up. And again, third, third guy is Sherman Powell, 29-year-old guy. And he was, he was from uh, Canada. And uh, interesting story about these guys. When they went to hang him, uh, Sherman was probably the biggest. He was, he was like 6'5" way over 250 pounds. His shoe size was 13. He a really big guy. And they knew he's the guy that, that, uh, that put the knife to Joe Montgomery, because when he slit this guy's throat, the only thing that was hanging this guy's head to his body was just a little piece of skin. So you know he really lacerated his throat when he cut him. So whoever did it was really strong. So I really pointed to Sherman Powell. So they, they knew he was the guy. Uh, so anyway, when they went to hang him, they brought him up behind the, uh, behind the courthouse. Over a couple of things. Again, the papers really did justice to a lot of this stuff. They wrote some really good stories. Even here where the, oops. Even here where they tested the scaffold. You know, while these guys were in the jail and they could hear all this stuff going on outside, they put, they put these weights, uh, they, they put the, uh, the nooses around some bags of sand so they could test the weight of the scaffold. So they, they were having fun out there pulling the lever and testing these weights, you know, and these, these guys you know, could hear this stuff going on. So it was kind of crazy. So anyway, they hanged these guys. Well, when they hanged uh, uh, O'Neill, Fisher, and Powell, when they took them out, they took them out of the back door of the, the uh, jail, and they walked them over to where they were going to hang them, put them up on the gallows. And Sherman Powell fainted once coming out the door, once when he saw the crowd that was there, and once when he realized that they were going to hang him. So what they did, before they put the black bag over their head, the black mask over their head, uh, these guys had their hands bound, you know, and their, and their feet were bound. So when they walked up, there was, there was Fisher, O'Neill, and Powell, and there was two deputies holding on to Powell. So 
the sheriff said, let's rearrange this position here, you know, because they're going to stand on this trap door that couldn't open. And they didn't want the deputies standing there with them. So they took these two guys, O'Neill and, and Fisher, so maybe I can switch you two guys. They put you in the middle, and then since your hands are bound like this, if you would hold your hand, if you would turn sideways, like this, and hold him by the shoulder, and you turn and hold this way, and put your hands up, you gotta hold, you gotta hold this guy. Right here, you gotta hold his arm. You gotta hold, you gotta hold him up because they're afraid he was gonna they're, they're afraid he was gonna faint. Yeah. So now you guys are on the trap door. As soon as they had that, they got the bag over your head. As soon as you guys grabbed hold of them, whoosh, you guys were gone. Oh. Yeah, you guys all went together. Let me sure hold on to each other. So, thank you for being part of the story. Oh. Am I out of time? Am I, uh, oh, keep going. We, we still got a couple more guys to hang. <laughs> uh, did, we, did we, anybody come here as a pair? Like husband and wife or friend and friend? Or? Right, right here, right here. Lana? <laughs> Is your name Harris? That would be a real bonus. <laughs> you don't have to be related. They weren't. We're not going to be related after this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're, we're, we're dealing with two people here, Monty Harris and William Harris. They met each other in prison. Oh, really? But they weren't even related. Do you want to be Bill or Monty? <laughs> oh, okay. you've got a headstone. Yeah. Okay. You're in the giggly weeds. No, you're right next to me. You don't have a headstone. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is a good, this is a good story. <laughs> Uh, the, these two guys, uh, William and Monty Harris. Uh, Monty Harris is going to be the only guy from Butte that was executed and hanged here. Everybody else was from elsewhere. But Monty was a born and raised Butte guy. Uh, he, he grew up on uh, 200 block of Curtis Street down in Silverville Homes now. Uh, the house was kind of a brothel at the time. And when he was young, he was a messenger boy and a gopher, and uh, he used to sell papers and do deliveries and stuff in the red light district. So growing up, he had a different appreciation for that side of town. Uh, he got into trouble, he was a pickpocket, and he was a you know, petty larceny guy, and he ended up in prison. And William Harris was uh, uh, another guy, he didn't have a good record either, and he was in the pen. So they both got out, and they met up with three other guys, and uh, uh, all these three guys would be were worked together on a, on a they like to drink beer. <laughs> and on a Thanksgiving evening, they were gonna rob the bank in Whitehall. That, that was a really good idea. They drank some more beer, and it was too late. It was too late to go to Whitehall. So they said, well, since it's Thanksgiving, there's probably a lot of people at the Hall and Rink, which is down where like Les Schwab Tire is now. And they went down there and they thought they'd rob that. By the time they got there, the guy that had the cash already left. So they decided they'd go to a different place, and they went to a place called the uh, Harrison Hotel. Mm -hmm. Anybody know about the Harrison Hotel? No. Mm -hmm. Harrison Hotel. Anybody have a guess where the Harrison Hotel was? Oh! Gee, um, there we go. What am I doing? <coughs> It's also called the Smith Hotel and the Smith Roadhouse. Harrison Amherst. This is about where that thriftway is now. Oh. This, this was, that was the, the Harrison Hotel and the Smith Roadhouse. Anyway, these, these fellows went down there and they uh, uh, they decided they'd rob this place since they missed on the other two. So they, they walked in the door here in the office. There's a guy named Cyril Sut Schilling, a 32 year old guy. And he was kind of the bouncer, uh, owner, uh, proprietor of the place. And he was there with his wife and, and another couple that was there. Uh, there were some folks that were here that were enjoying the evening, doing a little dancing and stuff there. And these guys came in. When they walked in, uh, the stuff chilling said, you know, you can have what you want. You know, just don't cause any trouble here. And the guy thought he was reaching for a gun, so he shot him, killed him. Uh, so they, they pushed his body to the side, went in here, lined everybody up in here that was in the dance hall, and they started robbing them all, taking their wallets and their, all their stuff. 
And there was one lady in there named Gladys Kelly, and she had a really nice diamond ring on. And these guys had a pair of pliers with them. And they said to the lady, if you don't get that ring off, we're going to cut your finger off. Oh, my God. So she was so scared that the ring just kind of slid off her finger. Yeah. Pretty neat. So. And, you know, so how, how pervy these guys are. And this one guy said to this one lady, he said, I really like those stockings you got on. My mom would look nice in them. But he didn't take them. <laughs> yeah, these guys are really bad. And then this is Bill Harris. He's, he's uh, God, these guys are like 26 years old. They're just young guys. All right. They had their picture taken for the paper for this hanging. The, the mud pictures are really bad. And they asked if they'd get their pictures taken. Probably oh, yeah, they're going to be in the paper. You know? Then he got this. This is mine. He's the beauty guy. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Anyway, these are their stories. You know, they died on the gallows. They paid the price. They made peace with the maker. But this guy is the only one that's got a headstone. And it's in a grassy <laughs> section. It looks pretty good. And, and his, uh, his partner, Bill Harris, is right next to him. So, so you guys are happily at rest out of Mount Ryan. Uh, Very good. Thank you for helping. Oh, wait, what's on you? Still looking like There you go. Very good. Thank you for helping. This, this could be our last butte guy. Any Italians in here? No Italian? Anybody like wine? <laughs> oh, come on. It's got to be a gal. You don't have to be a guy. Oh, come on up. No, he's gone. Are you Italian at all? Not a bit. Oh, Eddie. You like wine? Oh, yes. Oh, that'll work. <laughs> this is Tony Vacheri. You'll like this story. It's really good. Yeah, you can pretend you're Italian. Yeah, yeah. It's a fun one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't say, you know, when they hanged the Harris brothers, they didn't hang him in the back here where they hanged the first three guys. They hanged him in the lobby of the jail. Oh, wow. They set those gallows up in the entryway there. So when the guys dropped down, they had a uh, canvas around, and when they dropped down, it just dropped down into the stairwell. Hmm. In the back, when they did this, backwards, backwards. Come on. Yeah. You're going backwards. Yeah. Anyway, uh, when they hang those three guys in the back here, there, there was a. There was a set of stairs that went down here. Uh, I was hoping it was 13 stairs, but I think it's only eight uh, that went down here into the, into the room. But when they hanged these guys, they just had to bring it from their jail cell right out to the lobby here, and they hanged them in the lobby. And that's where they hanged the Harris brothers, or not brother, the Harris boys. What was the purpose? Why did, why did they do it in the lobby? Uh, they just figured it was a nicer place to do it. It was inside, and they could control the crowd better, and not many, as many people would see it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, this is where they hanged Tony Viteri. This was the last hanging in Butte. It'd be in, in the same place as the others. Oh, this is Monty again, yeah. He hung, he hung around, he lived down around in here. This is Curtis Street down here. This building's still there? It's yeah, a yeah. BFW? It's on the corner of Arizona and Mercury? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks a little different. That's, that's the building. Anyway, this, we think maybe that could be Monty. He might have been hanging around there then when they took that picture. <laughs> Don't know. This is Tony. Tony was an immigrant from uh, Italy. Uh, he was a miner, worked for the railroad. Uh, they thought he was crazy. You know, he had these Google guys. You know, he had those real strange blue eyes. One blue east and one blue west. <laughs> You're really kind of strange. And everybody thought Tony was crazy. But Tony liked to drink wine. He drank a lot of wine. So, anyway. Uh, when Tony came to Butte, he boarded at a house uh, that uh, a fellow named Joe Cicciarelli owned on Main Street in Meaderville, which is in the pit. And Joe Cicciarelli lived next door to Anton Favero. They were pretty good buddies. Well, I guess they weren't next door across the street and down. But anyway, they, they were buddies. But uh, Tony Viteri rented from Joe Cicciarelli. And he wasn't there very long before he took a shine to Joe's daughter, Mary Catherine, who was 15. Mm -hmm. And he was really getting a little bit carried away there, and Joe booted him out. 
So he left and went to Basin, and he was there mining for a while, and finally drifted back to Butte again to do a little prospect, do a little mining. And uh, one evening, Joe had a little, or, uh, Tony had a little bit too much wine, and grabbed his shotgun and headed towards Meterville. And when he went down to Meterville, it was just right after dinner, and who did he run across? But Joe Ciccirelli, who was at Anton Figaro's house, having had dinner. And they were out in front talking to each other, you know, over a white picket fence. You know, nothing more American than that. So Tony walked up to him, and Tony shot Joe uh, right in the chest, and he shot Anton Favero a little bit higher in the, sh in the shoulder. So anyway, Joe died right away, and Tony went to the hospital, or Anton, I should say, I don't want to mix him up with Tony. And Anton went to the hospital, and he said it was Tony Viteri who shot us and killed Joe. So they brought him to jail, and they put him in jail, and he had a he had a real long, drawn-out fight, you know, in uh, in the courts and stuff to try and save him. I heard a long, long story about different things. But there, there's another fellow. There was an Asian fellow named uh, uh, Louis Wan that was in jail with him, and he got his sentence commuted and got sent to prison and didn't get hanged. They were supposed to be hanged together, and he got away. So uh, Tony was mad about that because. You know, they let the chink off, but they kept the Italian guy in there, you know, Viva Mussolini. And the guy that did it was Judge Lynch. So that just really sent him over the top, the Irish guy taking care of him. I mean, this whole thing was just really crazy. Uh, hey, Jim, who was that John Durand or whatever? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I went too quick. Anyway, after Tony shot those two guys in Meterville, he was leaving Meterville, and on his way out, uh, there was a bridge there at East Butte there, where East Butte and Meterville connect. And right at that bridge, there was a fellow named John Duranja, who was a railroad watchman. And he was dressed in this kind of like a blue uniform with a blue hat. And we think Tony might have thought he was a cop. So we shot him, too, on top of the bridge. So by the end of the night, he killed three guys and left 18 children fatherless. Now, here, here Louis Wan, that's the... That was his Chinese soulmate that got away. Yeah. So yeah, this is pretty crazy. This kind of the story, you know, this guy's hang. Oh, when they went to, when they went to hang Tony, he was in the back room of the jail and he'd stolen one of the the spoons that they had given him to eat, and he fashioned that into kind of like a shift that he could use as like a knife. And just before that they were gonna hang him. He went back to where the, the shower was in the back and, and wiggled off a piece of pipe, you know, that was in the shower. He took a, you know, the union and the, the fitting apart and had this piece of pipe and this shiv. So when these guys, when the, the, the uh, undersheriff went in to get him to bring him out, he started to fight with him. And he was, Viva Mussolini, and I'm going to kill Judge Lynch, and all this. So anyway, they fired two rounds of tear gas in to settle this guy down. And when they dragged him off, he was still hacking and coughing when they put the cap on him and, and executed him. Uh, but the strange thing about this is uh, uh, yeah. they removed his brain afterwards. They thought this guy was crazy. So the doctors said, let's take his skull cap off and see if his brain is abnormal. You know, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe science, we can prove something here if we get. So they did that, and they checked his brain, and his brain was okay. <laughs> he just liked a lot of life. So anyway, that's your story, Tony. Thanks for helping. Best you, you can go ask some more wine. Yeah. So, so those are all the ones that were reviewed. We got two more. We got time, Kim, or am I? I'm over five minutes. It's okay. I'm, I'm almost done. I don't care. So if anybody needs to leave, they can leave. Yeah, okay. Don't feel bad. Am I boring anybody? You can walk out. <laughs> crazy stuff. I only got two left. Uh, Roy Walsh, Roy Walsh, young guy. Anybody like Buicks? <laughs> Nobody like Buicks. What year? <laughs> twenty-five. Oh, what year, Buicks? Yeah. Well, it had to be before twenty-five. <laughs> 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 he didn't live after twenty-five. Uh, let's see. Anybody from Seattle? Anybody kind of like a magician? Anybody like to work with wood? 
No, right there is a guy. Thanks. Yay. There we go. And are you Irish? No, you're not no. Irish. No, I'm not. But you can be, yeah, you can be Roy Walsh, though. He's a pretty neat guy. You have a good story. <laughs> Oh, okay. Thanks, Roy, for helping. Do uh, you know where Renova is? You remember know where Renova is? Renova is? Mm -hmm. Renova, over by Whitehall? Yeah. Had a little store there. A guy named Albert Johnson had a store there. Yeah. Well, anyway, Roy, and, uh, he had a buddy named Arthur Hughes that's from uh, the east side, Herod Flat. And they hook up together, and uh, this Albert Schoonover, this, this guy had a nickname, too. This was his alias. This was real name. Roy Walsh was his alias. Uh, anyway, he, he grew up in Seattle. He grew up in, in Minnesota and moved to Seattle. His parents split up. He was an orphan for a while. He lived with different ragtag families for a while. He was really independent on his own. So he's a pretty young guy. Uh, but they thought this guy was kind of like a magician. Uh, he, he, and he really liked Buicks. You know, whenever, whenever he stole cars and stuff, he stole Buicks because he really liked them. Uh, and he, he, he broke out of jail a couple times. You know, he was really kind of clever. Uh, he didn't last long. But this is Roy Walsh. He's kind of a handyman guy. Yeah, he worked his way back here. But he, he murdered a guy named Albert Johnson in Renova. He, they, he went after Oliver's. And they were going to rob him. And this guy he thought it was one of the neighbors that came back and forgot something. And just as he was going to open the door, uh, Roy Walsh blasted the door with a shotgun and killed this guy. And then they got scared. So he and his partner that was with him, they got scared and ran before they even robbed him. But they killed him. So they took off, and, and uh, uh, his accomplice came back to you and he, you know, squealed on him and said, this is the guy, I, I don't want any part of it. You know, I didn't do it, I wasn't in on it, I don't want to do anything with it. So he kind of got away. Uh, but this guy took a hike and, God, he traveled all over the country. He was in California and Oklahoma. And it was kind of funny, they, they realized that he was the guy because everywhere he went, he stole a Buick. You know, <laughs> and he, so. Anyway, they finally got him and they brought him back to you. This is at the, the front doors of the, the old new jail. And this is the guy that, Mountjoy, he was the, the sheriff over in Boulder. And when he was in Boulder, he had, somehow or another, he got the key to his jail cell from his inmate that he talked to. Had it for a minute and copied it on a piece of paper, got a piece of wood, and whittled himself a key. And when the bailiff went to gym, went to bed or went took a nap or whatever he was doing, this guy opened up the door with this wooden key, and he said nobody's going to believe me. So he hid the key up on top of the jail, up on top of one of the shelves in there. And later, when they caught him, they said, "How did you get out of that jail?" And he said, "I made a key." And they said, oh, "You can't make a key." He said, "Yeah, I made a key out of wood." And they said, "No, you're lying." He said, "No, I didn't." He said, check up on the thing up there in the jail, up on the top. And he said, you'll find my key. And they went and looked. And sure enough, there was this thing they made out of wood up on the shelf. Yeah, crazy. So he's pretty clever. He's only in his 20s. He's a pretty young guy. Yeah, so that's, that's the end of Roy. That's, Roy was pretty quick. He was pretty young. Wasn't the youngest, but he was pretty young. Ah, this is a good one. Any barbers in here? Any beauticians? Oh, you gotta have one beautician. None? None more tissue. Beautician? <laughs> Nobody want to volunteer? I need, I need a gal for this one. What do you think? Wouldn't, wouldn't a gal be good for this one? Yeah. George Hoffman? What do you think? Yeah. Helen, do you want to be a. Yes, Helen, sure. You, know, you like to be a barber? No, I want to be a beautician. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see what my nose is. You ever been to Shoto? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, that's my claim to fame. Oh, good deal. Yeah, you know where the Bull Crane Hotel is? No, no, I don't. Oh, well, you will shortly. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this is George Hoffman. Thanks, Ellen, for being George. Sure. George Hoffman, a 52-year-old guy. He was a barber. Uh, he came from Minnesota. He didn't make my pillows, though. Uh, he came from, he came from uh, Minnesota, and he was living in Bynum. Anybody know where Bynum is? Look at all these strange, you know where Bynum is, yeah. Pretty big town, right? 
Vina. It's up, it's up by Shovel, up north. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, uh, George Hoffman was drifting around and, and went to Shovel and uh, uh, he went to a cigar club that was there and uh, it was kind of next to where his little barber shop was kind of set up. And he, uh, in the barber shop that he was in, he grabbed this big chunk of pipe and when it was closing time, he went next door to the cigar club that George Burrell operated. And he went in there and hit him over the top of the head with this two inch pipe and knocked him out and uh, went over and, and robbed him. It was robbing the, the, the till. Uh, but he, he heard this guy moaning and he went back over and the guy wasn't dead. So he grabbed a telephone cord, wrapped it around his neck and then choked him to death. Uh, and it must have been bloody where he hit him on the head because he got blood all over his hands. So when he took all the money out of the cash register and stuffed all the money in his pockets, he, he got blood all over the money. So uh, he was staying at the Beaupre Hotel. I mean, where the Beaupre? I've never seen it. I didn't mean, see a picture of it. But he, he stayed at the Beaupre Hotel. Well, the next morning when he was, when he was uh, kind of uh, paying his bills, and, well, right after that he went and got some whiskey. <laughs> He went and got a bunch of whiskey and was drinking in his room and stuff, but uh, he only got 210 bucks. But uh, when he went to pay his bill the next morning, when he when he paid the bill, uh, or when he, whenever he, whatever he used the money in exchange for, he had blood on the money that he gave the lady, and all of a sudden this guy ended up dead right next door. So naturally, the sheriff and the, the uh, deputies went in and were checking that stuff. You know, this guy was the guy that they were going to be looking for. So, you know, they went, they went and picked him up and they arrested him. And they looked in his room and in, a, in a sock underneath the tub was all this money that he robbed from the cigar club. And it was all full of bloody money. So it kind of connected this guy. So uh, he was in, in Shoto and they hanged this guy in a warehouse, you know, in, uh, in Shoto, big machine shop, in like a warehouse. And nobody would claim his body after they after they hanged him. So five days later, they buried him in Potter's Field north of Shoto. And he said when they were gonna hang him, he said, the only person lower than me is the one that told my mom that I did this and that I was gonna be hanged. So, so that was kind of his claim to fame. So, anyway, so we got our gallows and they returned him back to Butte. So we know that, that those are one, they were marked. Uh, on the gallows, it says on them that they were uh, they were shipped to Boulder and shipped to Shoto. So we, when we first saw those, it had that stamp on there, and we wondered why they were imbued if they had a stamp on them from Boulder. So we thought maybe they weren't ours, but they were returned and they just stamped it. So thanks, Ellen, for being George. Sure. Are we good? Thank you. Uh-huh. So anyway, uh, we got our gallows back, and as far as the future of the gallows, they're pretty safe in the basement. I don't think they'll be disturbed. They're locked up. Uh, only the chief executive has a key. Uh, everything that's there that's needed to assemble them are there, even the nuts and bolts. Uh, the only thing you don't have is a sack for the forehead, or a sack for the head, or the noose. They have to, they'll have to get that. So that's kind of the future of that. So Anyway, everybody knows what this is, right? The French yeah. had during the revolution had a guillotine. You know, so are we any better than they are? I mean, they chopped the head off and dropped it in a basket. We just dropped everybody out of sight. So if you believe in that, uh, when, when we do this for our historical connection to the past, uh, it's always said that, you know, when they did the execution of the guillotine, the, the French would always allow people to come up and touch the guillotine before an execution. Because if it did, it could send that bad juju or that bad mojo into the netherworld, and all your bad feelings and your bad vibes would disappear. So, do you believe in that kind of a theory? And if you do believe in that, would you want to touch the handle of the gallows, the galloping gallows number five? and send all your misery into the netherworld. If you do, you're welcome to grab a hold of the galloping gallows lever 
It's been used for the execution of Sorry? You want to see? I'll hold this here and you can come up and take a look. I'm done. Thank you. Anybody have any questions?